Hi everyone, it's Alyssa. Now that we've talked about how all the modules are generated, let's take a look at how those modules come together to create the buildings. If you haven't watched part one of the building generator videos, I recommend you go back and check that video out before watching this one. The building tool takes in wall and filler modules, just like the tower tool. It also takes roof modules and pillar modules, which are these vertical pillars that get placed between the walls and the buildings. The reason I use these separate pillar modules instead of the ones built into the wall generator is because for the modules to align correctly, I need the pillars to be aligned with the walls a bit differently than how I want them for the towers. Here's an example of what I mean. When I line the walls up, at first glance it looks okay, but if you look closely, the pillars are not aligned symmetrically. This is most obvious when viewed from a top perspective. You can see that at the corners, the pillars are differently aligned with the different walls. If I alter the grid so that it looks like the pillars are aligned the same at each corner, then each wall will no longer be centered. As you can see, the right side of each wall intersects more with the pillars than the left. Additionally, I found that in order to make sure the pillars are always visible, I want to shift each pillar slightly away from its building's footprint. If I view a building from the bottom, you can see what I mean. These squares are the pillars, and notice how each one is shifted out slightly away from the walls, and the corners are shifted off at a diagonal. Because these offsets are different depending on where each pillar is placed, I need the pillars to be able to move independently of the wall modules, so it's easiest to feed them in separate modules. The pillar modules themselves are just beveled boxes, so I just put them together with this simple network here, instead of creating a whole module generator HDA for them. The final input to the building generator is a building blockout, which you can see here. Similarly to the tower generator, the building blockouts require blockout IDs. However, for the buildings, these blockout IDs must be unique because the building generator uses these IDs rather than connectivity to identify the different buildings. The reason it does this is because some buildings are made of multiple boxes. For example, this building, this building, this building, and this building are all made of multiple boxes. I don't want to boolean them together before feeding them into the system because the system relies on the inputted blockout buildings all being made of boxes and not more complicated boolean union shapes. I decided to set the system up this way because first, from the tool development standpoint, it makes it much easier for the procedural system to identify the different parts of each building. And second, from a user standpoint, Booleaning geometry is slow, so it's actually easier to just feed in separate boxes that intersect each other anyways. The building generator then takes that block out and tries to create buildings that match its shapes. The main idea is I extract a footprint from each building. Then I try to snap that footprint to a grid to ensure that the wall modules will fit together with no gaps. Then I pick modules to best match the block out height. Let's take a look at how that works. Here's the inside of the building generator tool. This pink for loop encompasses pretty much the entire building generator. This for loop loops over each building blockout. This first part processes the blockout and turns it into a simple footprint that is snapped to a grid, like I mentioned before. These nodes in blue network boxes take care of placing the roof modules. These nodes in yellow network boxes take care of placing the walls. And these nodes in the dark orange network box place the pillars. The white network boxes indicate where module inputs are processed. Now let's walk through this network in more detail. First, I offset the blockout ID by the seed set on the building generator. Then I want to center the building at the origin and straighten it out to make the geometry easier to work with for the rest of the network. At the end of the network, I'll restore the original position and orientation. I use a match size to move the building to the origin. Then, I straighten the building out. I do this by first grouping all the primitives that are on the top or the bottom of the building. Then I use this measure node to calculate the area of all the primitives that are not in the top and bottom group I created. In other words, all the primitives on the sides. Then, I sort the primitives by area, reversing the point sort so the largest primitive will have primnum zero. I set the normals on all the primitives, and then I use the fact that the largest primitive must have primnum zero to calculate the rotation needed to align the largest side primitive's normal 
to the z-axis. Then I apply that rotation in this transform, aligning the building. Next, I want to extract the footprint of the building. I do this by grouping the primitives with normals in the negative y direction and blasting the other primitives. As I presented this, I realized I could do this in one less node with the lab's split prim by normal node, so I switched that out. Sometimes, depending on the inputted block out, the different pieces of the footprint might not align with each other. So I used this attribute expression to snap them down to the ground plane. Then, I Boolean union them together and used the lab's extract borders node to get only the outline of the footprint. Now I've successfully extracted the footprint of the building. Now, I snap that footprint to the best possible grid to ensure it's possible to fit wall modules around the footprint without any gaps. Because the ideal grid sizing is highly dependent on the user's needs, I expose some parameters to the user so they can direct this grid fitting process. Specifically, they can set the min and max module size, as well as the number of fitting iterations, which are the number of sizes between the min and max module size that the algorithm attempts to fit the building footprint to. Now let's look at how that's done. This orange for each loop loops over all the fitting iterations. I first use a fuse node to get rid of any messy geometry. Then, in this wrangle, I calculate the grid spacing that this iteration should attempt to fit based on the min and max module sizes, the number of fitting iterations, and the current fitting iteration. I set this fuse node to the snap to grid option and drive the grid spacing and grid tolerance based on the value calculated in the wrangle above, which makes the fuse node snap the footprint to a grid with that spacing. Then I have this switch, which feeds in nothing if the number of points changed when the footprint was snapped to grid. This gets rid of any problematic results when a grid's fit is especially poor. For example, if a building footprint like this turns into something like this or this, you can see that in both of these problematic cases, the number of points changes. So this switch will eliminate those options. This is also why I include this first fuse node. This ensures that any points that are already very close together and then get snapped together do not trigger this condition. Next, I measure how much each point has been displaced from its original position. I then promote that point attribute to a primitive attribute by summing up each point's displacement value to get a total displacement. I later use this total displacement to evaluate which of the eligible snapped footprints best match the original blockout. Then, I resample the snap footprint, so there is one point for each wall module that should be placed. I also transfer the grid spacing attribute and promote it to a primitive attribute to be used later. Then I get all the snap footprints that were not eliminated. In this case, that's only two footprints. If the user finds that the system is not generating enough good matches, they can try changing the minimum or maximum module sizes or increasing the number of fitting iterations. So if I increase the fitting iterations to 20, you'll see that more eligible footprints are generated. Then I sort the primitives by the total displacement attribute I set earlier, and I delete all the primitives that are not the one with the smallest displacement. As you can see, this doesn't perfectly match the footprint, but it still approximates its shape. If this result isn't good enough for the user, they can always adjust the settings on the tool until they get a fit they're satisfied with. Note that it is possible for no valid snapped footprint to be generated. In this case, this switch will make the system fall back on this backup option, which is just a rectangle fit to the original footprint and snapped and resampled to the smallest grid size. Now that we have this snapped footprint, we're ready to start placing modules. I'll start by explaining the wall module placement, then the pillar modules, then the roofs. The wall modules are input here and then processed in a similar way to the aqueduct and tower generators. Updating the module IDs so the filler and wall module IDs don't collide, splitting and separately packing the different materials and bounding box, and then extracting representative points to be processed by the wrangle that picks the wall modules. These representative points each store the module ID and the bounding box size of each module so this information can be easily accessed when picking wall modules. I already went over how and why I do this in the aqueduct and tower generator videos, so I'll just dive straight into how I pick the wall modules. This network box on the left selects wall modules that will best match the blockout's height and creates a stack of these modules. This network box on the left extracts source points and orientations from wall module placement, 
Then the stack of wall modules is instanced around. Just like with the other generators, I do these calculations and placements on the wall module bounding boxes, and then inject the final wall modules at the end. Now let's take a closer look at how I pick the wall modules. First, I get the target dimensions for the overall stack of wall modules. I do this by taking one segment of the snap footprint and feeding it into the zeroth input of the wrangle in order to find the wall module's width. The third input of the wrangle takes in the original block out, from which it can calculate the target height to match. Next, I create arrays of what the heights of all the wall and filler modules would be once they're scaled to the target width. I then randomly fill up the wall the same way I do in the tower generator. If there is remaining space, I fill it with filler modules. Unlike the tower generator, which selects one filler module at the top of each stack of walls, the building generator can select up to one filler module per wall. I then create points to represent the selected walls and filler modules that will be fed to the copy to points below in order to place the modules. Lastly, while I was using the building generator, I noticed an edge case where if I accidentally make the building very short so that no walls or fillers can fit, the system will fail when it reaches the pack inject and finds no modules. To safeguard against this case, I made the system add one filler module if no wall or filler modules were selected. In this case, I also set this attribute to flag this error. I'll return to how this attribute is used later. Finally, I delete the segment that I fed in, and I use this copy to points to create the module stack. On the right, I get the points to instance the modules on by turning each line segment in the snap footprint into its own primitive with a carve node. Then, I use an orient along curve node to get normal vectors for each point. You can see that this orient along curve creates these yellow normals. However, I don't want these to point along the curve as they do now. Instead, I want them to point outwards from the building. I'm able to do this by crossing the normal with the up vector, 0, 1, 0. I then promote this attribute to a primitive attribute, so that when I extract the centroid of each primitive, this attribute can be correctly transferred. Now, I can instance the stack of walls onto every one of these points, and they will be correctly oriented based on the normal attribute. Finally, I inject in the actual wall modules. Next, let's take a look at how the pillars are placed. The pillars are read in here and resized based on the tool's max pillar width setting. Then they get placed by these nodes here. Just like for the wall modules, I take the path of the snap footprint and I create normals that are oriented facing out from the footprint. However, for the pillars, I do not extract the centroids because I want the pillars to be placed between each wall. I then shift each point along its normal so every pillar is slightly offset from the walls. In order to create the stack of pillars that gets placed at each point, first, I choose a random pillar from the inputted pillars. I also create a line whose size matches the height of the stacked wall modules. I then chain the pillar modules along this line and use a match size node to rescale them to fit the line's height exactly. Then I instance the pillars around the footprint and inject the pillar modules. I approach placing the pillars this way because I wanted to provide an example of how to do this sort of module fitting and placement without using a lot of vex. However, do note that this chain node is relatively slow and can be a bit of a bottleneck for the building generator, so it might be worth implementing these pillars with vex instead. Lastly, let's take a look at how the roof modules are placed. Just like the walls, the roof modules are read in and their bounding boxes are packed separately. I then randomly select and isolate one of the roofs to be placed on the current building, and I create representative points on that roof. Just like the walls and fillers, these representative points store the bounding box size of each roof module to be used when placing the modules. In order to place the roof modules, I take the unboolean rectangles that the footprint was originally extracted from, and I snap them to match the chosen grid spacing. The reason I do this instead of just using the snap footprint we used for the walls and pillars is because I want to be able to process each of the original primitives separately to place a different section of roofs. This primitive wrangle then loops through each of these primitives, placing the roof middle and end pieces. Note that unlike the wall modules, which we want to exactly fit the footprint shape, I want these roof modules to extend a bit beyond the edge of each primitive. If I don't do that, the roofs end up looking a bit silly. 
wanting this bit of overhang is nice because it gives us a bit of wiggle room when placing the roofs. Here I specify a minimum and maximum overhang amount so that all the roof modules must overhang the edge of the building by at least the minimum amount, avoiding silly looking roofs that align perfectly with the edges of buildings. But they also must be under the maximum overhang amount, avoiding roofs that are too long. First, I take the current primitive and find whether it is longer in the X or Z direction. From this information, I then set a target length and width for the roof. I will scale the roofs in order to match the target width and use the number and type of roof middle pieces placed to match the target length. In order to do this, I first create an array of what the scaled lengths of each roof module will be once it is scaled to match the target width. I then iteratively place the roof modules, ensuring that they stay below the max overhang amount, but also surpass the minimum overhang amount. I do this by greedily placing roof modules, starting with the largest one. If placing the current roof module would exceed the max overhang value, I then move to placing the next largest roof module. I continue this process until the minimum overhang amount is exceeded. Note that depending on the inputted roof modules, it may be impossible to place a set of roof modules that is between the min and max overhang amounts if the min and max amounts are too restrictive. In order to avoid errors in this case, I adjust the max overhang amount to make sure that the difference between the min and max overhang amounts is at least as large as the length of the smallest scaled roof module. Once the middle roof modules are chosen, I place points representing the roof modules to be fed into a copy to points to place the roof modules. I don't need to do any selection of the end cap modules because there is only one option. So I can just place these points at the two ends along the longer axis of the inputted primitive. I then loop through the chosen middle roof modules, creating points representing them at the correct places, in addition to the usual attributes like module ID, normal, and P scale that are used to instance, scale, and orient the modules. I also set an attribute on each module that records which primitive it originates from, as well as whether or not it's an end cap. I use these attributes in groups later to identify which roofs are eligible for placing dormers and chimneys. Ignoring these nodes for a moment, these points are then fed into a copy to points, which places the bounding boxes for the selected roof modules. I then use a match size to align these roofs to the top of their building, and I use a pack inject to inject the final roof modules. Returning to the nodes I skipped earlier, these nodes group the roof modules that are eligible for placing dormers and chimneys. I'm going to switch to another building example that will better illustrate this process. Let's take a look at how the system determines which of the roofs on this building are eligible for placing dormers and chimneys. Essentially, I don't want it to place dormers and chimneys at locations where multiple roof pieces intersect. So on this roof, I want dormers and chimneys to be placed here, but I wouldn't want dormers and chimneys to be placed here, where they might intersect with this smaller segment of roof. In order to do this, I process the points representing the roofs before copying the roof modules onto them, so I can group which points represent roof modules that should be eligible for dormers and chimneys, and this group will be transferred to the modules once they're copied to the points. This for loop loops through the points representing wall modules, with each pass processing all the points from one source primitive. Let's take a look at how one iteration works. First, here are the points representing the roof modules on the larger part of the building. So these points represent the roof modules in this section. First, I separate the end cap points because only the middle roof module should have dormers and chimneys placed on them. I do this using the end cap group that was set in the wrangle that selected the roof modules. Then. I start by adding all the points to the group of roof modules eligible for features to be added, and then I subtract the ineligible points from the groups. I subtract those points by taking the primitives the roofs were originally generated from and isolating the primitives that were not the source of the current roof points. Note that for some buildings, this would be multiple primitives. In this case, it's just one. I then thicken this geometry so it will contain the roof module points that are close to this part of the roof. I also have a peak node to ensure that this will be large enough to encompass the necessary points. This boolean does nothing in this case, but in the cases where multiple different primitives come in through this stream, this boolean unions them together, ensuring that this group node will process them correctly. Now, I use this group node set with the merge type subtract from existing to subtract any points within the inputted bounding regions 
from the Add Features group. Note that without this peak node, the geometry is not actually big enough to select the desired points, but with it, it only leaves this roof module, which corresponds to this piece here, which is exactly what we want. This system is a bit conservative, as this roof module could also be eligible for dormers and chimneys, but visually, this doesn't cause any problems in the final result. Finally, these iterations are all merged together. When the modules are copied to points, this point group is transferred to the modules. With that group established, all the different building modules can be merged together. This wrangle is responsible for coloring the geometry as a warning if any problems are found during the building generation process. I mentioned two of these possible errors before, the first being the possibility that no matching footprint was generated, and the second being the possibility that the building was either too small or too short for any wall modules to be fit to it. The final possible error is that there may be conflicting blockout IDs. I detect that over here. If after the primitives that create the original building footprint are booleaned together, there are more than one connected pieces, this condition in the wrangle will be triggered. If these conditions are triggered, they then assign the corresponding building a color depending on settings on the building tool. In this warning colors folder, the user can set different colors to indicate these issues. So for example, if I go make a building too small, then it will turn orange, like so. Or if I make two buildings blockout IDs conflict, then they'll turn red. Ideally, this tool would have logic to adapt and handle all these cases, but unfortunately, I didn't have time to implement all that, so I created these warnings instead. So at least the user can adapt their settings to manually address these errors themselves. After any applicable warning colors have been applied, I revert the original position and rotation of the building. I also transfer the blockout ID attribute back onto the building. Note that I have a primitive attribute that makes it easy to loop through each building for dormer and chimney placement, as well as a point attribute that makes it easy to assign different UVs to different buildings during texturing. Finally, I go through the same process of optionally unpacking different materials and deleting attributes and groups as the other two architecture generators. Now that we've generated the buildings, let's take a look at how we can add dormers and chimneys. The HDA for placing dormers and chimneys takes in the generated buildings as the first input. For the second and third inputs, it takes the dormer and chimney modules to be placed. The dormer and chimney modules must have unique module IDs, so the system can tell the different modules apart. The user can control the random seed for selecting and placing these modules, as well as the chimney scale. Now let's take a look at how this is done. The buildings come into the tool here and are fed into this for each loop, which loops over each building. Just like the other architecture generators, each building's blockout ID is used as its random seed. So I start by offsetting each building's blockout ID by the tool's random seed so that it will randomize the tool's outputs. Then I isolate the roof modules that the building generator designated as available for placing dormers and chimneys. For this building, that's all of them. I then unpack them. There are two unpacks here because depending on the packing mode of the building generator, there may be two levels of pack geometry. Then I use the lab's split primitive by normal node to convert the roof modules to surfaces, and I use a fuse node to further simplify the incoming geometry. Next, I isolate one section of roof. In this case, this does nothing because there already is only one section of roof. Next, I want to rotate the roof to align with the x-axis to make the rest of the dormer and chimney placement simpler. I do this by extracting one of the lines at the top of the roof and using this wrangle to calculate the rotation needed to align it to the x-axis. Then I apply that rotation to the roof with this transform. Next, I want to split this roof in half and use half of the roof for placing dormers and the other half for placing chimneys. I want to get rid of any lines from the seams between different roof modules. I do this by using the lab's dissolve flat edges node. This now makes it easy to split the roof in half because if I reverse sort the points by their Y value, I can be guaranteed that these top two points will be point zero and one. Using that information, I can use the point split node to split these points apart. Although you can't see the difference, that top edge is now an unshared edge. You can see this if I drop down a lab's fast group unshared node. You can see that before the point split, the top edge was a shared edge, but afterwards, I have two separate pieces. So now I can use this connectivity node and a split to separate these pieces. Dormers get placed on the piece that goes through the left branch, and chimneys are placed using the right branch. 
Let's first take a look at the dormers. First, I have another lab split primitive by normal node to get rid of extremely steep parts of the roof. Next, I want to divide this roof surface into pieces to place dormers on. To do that, I use the lab's poly slice node. This poly slice node on the left divides the roof into two pieces, and this one on the right divides the roof into three pieces. I switch between these two options depending on the roof's dimensions and the random seed. So if the roof is wider, I'm more likely to divide it into three pieces. And if the roof is narrower, I'm more likely to divide it into two pieces. Next, I loop through each one of these slices and I fit a dormer to each slice. Just like the other architecture generators, the dormers come in, get split from their bounding boxes, and get their materials packed separately. I then place these bounding boxes and inject the dormer geometry at the end. Now let's take a look at how the dormers get fit to each slice. First, I set a primitive normal so I'll know how to orient the dormers. Then, I extract the centroid from the slice. Usually, dormers are placed towards the bottom of the roof and not exactly in the middle. So I use this wrangle to move the point down, and then I use a ray node to snap the point back to the roof surface. Now this point is ready to have a dormer copied to it. The dormers come in through this input. I randomly pick a dormer based on the blockout ID, and then I resize it based on the size of the roof slice. I use this match size node to make sure that the bottom of the bounding box is aligned with the x-axis, so when the dormer is placed, the bottom of the dormer will be aligned with the roof. Now, I just copy the bounding box to the point that I extracted from the roof slice. This loop runs over each roof slice, placing a bounding box for each one. Then, I use a pack inject to inject the actual dormer modules. Now let's take a look at how the chimneys are placed. Just like the dormers, the chimneys get their different materials packed separately, and then a random chimney is picked for the given building. I also do the same process of using the lab's split primitives by normal node to delete steep primitives. But for the chimneys, I'm a bit more restrictive because very steep angles cause the bottom of the chimney to stick out from the roof, even with the extra base geometry. Then, I shrink the roof along its length using the lab's transform from centroid node. This ensures that chimneys are not placed too close to the edge of the roof. I also clip the roof so that chimneys don't get placed too close to the top or bottom. And then I scatter one point onto the available area for the chimney to be placed on. And I set the p-scale based on the tool settings. Now the chosen chimney is copied to that point. The chimneys and dormers are merged and the rotation we did earlier to align the roof to the x-axis is reverted. This process is repeated for every building. The chimneys and dormers can either be fully packed or have their materials packed separately, just like the other architecture generators. Finally, the dormers and chimneys are merged with the original buildings and output. With the exception of the materials I explained in more detail in the first building video, the materials for the buildings are handled the same way as the aqueduct and tower generators. With the shading groups created by the module generators, noise textures generated in COPS, and materials assigned in LOPS based on the shading groups. This concludes this video on building generation. I hope you enjoyed the video, and in the next one, we'll be talking about stylized terrain generation. Thanks for watching.